Given the day off, a young maid spends the day with the son of a rich family who is engaged to someone else. The events of this day lead to everything she does with her life afterwards. The movie opens with a woman staring out the window. The chirping of birds can be heard in the background. The woman wipes the window with a cloth. Jane Fairchild is a 22-year-old maid working for Mr. and Mrs. Sniven, the owners of Beechwood, who both grieve after losing their children in the First World War, as this movie takes place just a few years after it. Jane's voice narrating, as well as her scribbling, can be heard as she wipes the window. She starts to talk about the time before the boys were lost during the war, referring to Mr. and Mrs. Sniven's children. Her voice stops and a solemn instrumental music plays in the background while the screen shows different places of a big house without people, showing its loneliness. A horse running on a grass field in slow motion is shown while Paul, a son of the Sheringham family, who lives nearby to the Nervins, narrates in the background about it being a racehorse named Fandango, that never wins but serves as their hope for fame and glory, on the racecourses of southern England. Only half of his face is shown as he narrates. Three boys, including the man narrating, cheer inaudibly at the other side of the field behind a rail. He continues to say that they had a deal in which their mother and father own the head and the body of the horse, and that the three boys seen earlier, Dick, Freddy, and him, own a leg each. Jane asks who owns the fourth leg. He lightly smiles while replying that it was always the question. Jane's scribbling is once again heard. An alarm rings and the screen tells us that it is the 30th of March or Mother's Day, a day where servants are given the day off to visit their mothers. Jane gets out of bed and washes her face and body from a small bowl of water. She gets dressed with her apron, fixes her long hair up, and looks at the mirror shortly before going downstairs. She seems to be the first one to wake up in the house. She stares out through the kitchen window and scrubs a kitchen utensil harshly. The sun rises and now, Mr. and Mrs. Niven are both awake and awaiting breakfast on the table. Mr. Niven says it is a gorgeous day and Jane agrees while serving them their breakfast. He turns to his wife and asks her if she thinks so too. Mrs. Niven does not meet her husband's eye and remains silent. He looks down and continues to talk about a thing that they used to do at the lake at Henley, as he puts butter on his bread. He again asks his wife for her thoughts on what he just said. She answers coldly with a straight face, still not meeting his eye. Jane takes a look up at her while pouring their tea at the table. Mr. Niven says that he and his wife will be away, and that Jane and Millie, a cook working for Mr. and Mrs. Niven, have the whole day to themselves. She thanks him politely. He continues to share that he and his wife will join a lunch assembly with the Hobdays and the Sheringhams at Henley, by the water. There was a moment of silence, and Jane replies to him positively, after noticing that Mrs. Niven isn't going to. He looks at Jane and asks her about what she would do for the day, as she is an orphan and doesn't have a mother figure to go to. Jane opens her mouth to answer but the telephone suddenly rings. He signals her to go and answer it. She leaves the room to do so. Mr. Niven sees his wife still looking at the empty space blankly. He looks at her and looks down. Jane answers the phone. A man's voice answers, asking for Jane. She answers to him as if he were a woman, to hide the fact that he is indeed a man. She smiles. A flashback of Jane bare-skinned, lying on the bed with a man standing, who is bare-skinned as well, is shown. Mr. Niven asks her who called their house. She lies by telling him that the caller only called them by accident. He speculates for a bit but then believes her in no time. Jane cleans up the table. He gives her a tip. She takes it and thanks him. He tells her that Millie will be taking the first bicycle to go off and proceeds to ask her regarding her means to go off. She replies that she will be taking herself off and will ride the second bicycle. He says to her that that is what he would do as well when left to his own devices. A pen writing the word devices on paper is shown on the screen. He offers her to take a book if she wishes to, she thanks him. He then leaves the room. The screen shows a typewriter typing the word it. A telephone rings in the background. An old and wrinkly woman is shown sitting by the window with a pen and a notebook. The woman is Jane many years later. Jane goes to the kitchen and informs Millie that she can already go home to her mother. She jokingly complains about her being with her mother. Jane responds by joyfully saying that it is a beautiful day. Millie tells her that she hates Jane when she is cheerful. Jane iterates that they have the whole day to themselves and says that she can set Millie off and cycle with her. Millie asks her where she is off to, to which Jane doesn't answer verbally and instead looks at her shortly before walking out of the kitchen. Millie smiles as she watches her leave, she already knows the answer to her unanswered question. They both cycle off to go to the station. They joke about Millie's mother and her unreasonable and somehow funny actions along the way. They stop at the church where the bell tolls. Jane imagines a newlywed couple coming out of it. She asks Millie if she thinks that they are honest with each other. Millie is confused. Jane talks about how she wonders what the Nivens, the Sheringhams, and the Hobdays say to one another. Millie says it is probably about the upcoming wedding. They talk about the joy of it. Jane cycles off quickly, leaving Millie behind. They stop at the train station, and Millie goes on one to go to her home. 
Jane cycles on a road in the middle of a field. She stops by a fence. A flashback to earlier that morning shows. The man calling her earlier, addressing her as Jay, gave her instructions to a meeting place. She stops by a big house. Jane parks the bicycle and rings the bell to the house. Jane with short hair, looking just a few months or so older, holds a piece of bread while looking as if she is remembering something. She remembers her thought, which was that he was waiting just behind the door. Paul answers to open the door. This is what the older Jane that we saw earlier was remembering about. The flashback of their call earlier is shown once again. Inside, the two talk about the shower as the screen goes to show the same words being written on paper. The shower refers to his parents. Jane asks him who thought of the term. He says that it was either Dick or Freddie who made up the term. Their talk goes on to the origin of Jane's name. She says that it was a common name in the orphanage. He says it suits her and starts walking towards her. He talks about the orchids in front of her, and then says that they were not there to look at flowers. Jane hides her smile. He holds her hand and takes her to a room. Romantic music plays in the background as they share a passionate kiss. The scene changes to a flashback of Jane buying vegetables. A fellow customer, Ethel, notices her and addresses her as the new girl at Beechwood, and says that she works for the Sheringhams at Upley. They say their names to each other. Paul walks up to them and asks for Jane's name. Ethel introduces her. Jane answers shyly to Paul's questions about the Nivens. That was their first encounter. Going back to the present, Paul tells her that he said to his parents that he is busy studying law, as a reason why he will be late for their assembly. A romantic music starts as he affectionately removes Jane's clothing from down top, and they share an intimate moment. A flashback shows Paul paying her money afterwards and asks if he has offended her. She tells him to not pay her at all, instead. He tells her that he wishes to take her out someday. They have been having an affair for quite some time. While both still undressed, Paul tells Jane that he will meet his wife to be at the picnic, later that day with the three families. He is betrothed to Emma Hobday, the daughter of one the Hobdays. Emma puts on her makeup to go to the picnic. She drives the vehicle fast to the picnic with her father and mother, while pointing out that her mother is judging her for her driving. Paul and Emma have just finished making love. Paul lights a cigarette on the side of the bed and stands to the window. He remembers a time when he was young and his brothers, Dick and Freddie were still alive, as well as the two sons of the Nivens. He tells Jane of how the three families used to gather at the lake, the same one that they are going to meet at today, to have a picnic, and how Mrs. Niven even used to play with them in the water, and how she would always beat them at it. He is fond of this memory, smiling at some parts while he tells it. Yet, his face goes blank towards the end of his story. He slightly turns his head to the side and ends it, saying that he will be late for the picnic. Jane, short-haired, is shown writing on her notebook in bed, next to a man of different race, Donald, sleeping. The three families were already at the picnic and chatting. Only the Nivens and Emma seem quiet. Paul tells Jane that he should go. Jane gets up and notices his stain on the sheets where she was laying on. She remembers washing a sheet with the same stain. It was after her first with Paul wherein she bled. The screen goes to show a flashback of them two talking about it. Paul tells her he hurt her, and she says it is a good ache. She notices a different fluid along with her blood and asks him what it is. He says that it is his seed and that it shouldn't be planted. She asks with sarcasm, what if they did plant it and continues to sing a song about planting. Paul joins in, laughing, and they share a kiss. Millie asks about the stain as Jane washes the sheet, and shares to her that she and her man never had more than a kiss. Back to the present, Paul cleans himself up. Jane takes a look at the belongings of his late brothers. The scene changes to when the three families were having dinner at the Nivens and Jane was serving them. She and Paul exchange glances with each other. Mr. Niven asks Paul about his studies at law school. Paul jokes about how his father doesn't trust him in it. This makes Jane smile. The screen shows the word lawyer being written on paper. Paul continues to talk about his future plans of working in London as a lawyer. His father stops him when he mentions his late brothers. The rest change the topic and talk about the food that they are eating. Jane rushes into the kitchen. Millie asks her if the guests are eating everything. Jane replies that they are talking about the food but she's not entirely sure how much they are eating it. Millie asks about Emma. Jane tells her that she looks bored while pouring wine into a glass. Millie asks her when she thinks they should serve the dish she is preparing. Jane says about half an hour, hurrying to leave the kitchen. Millie adds to say that Jane is spending a lot of time at the dining table with the three families. Jane reasons that she is just being attentive and goes back to the dining area. She sees that they are congratulating Paul and Emma on their engagement. Jane fakes a smile and leaves the room, dismayed. One night, Paul explains to Jane that he needs to get married, be a lawyer, and have a family. He shares that Emma was supposed to marry James Niven, but the two didn't get to be officially engaged as James was killed during the war. Jane smokes a cigarette while listening to his story. He continues to talk about James's memory and how Jane would have liked him, to which Jane stops him, saying that she likes him instead. Paul smiles faintly and tells her that he can tell all of his secrets to her. He stares at her for a long period of time before saying that she is a friend to him. Jane looks down, looking disheartened, and tells him that he is her friend as well. At the picnic, Emma is hot-headed and arrogantly asks the waiter to pour her a glass of champagne. She grumbles about how they are waiting too long for Paul to show up. 
Mr. Niven defends that he is studying and it is dedicated of him to do so. She asks the waiter again to pour her champagne, this time more bossy. The waiter nervously walks to her to do what he is told. Meanwhile, Paul gets dressed for the picnic while Jane smokes, still without her clothes on. They talk about what Emma might do if she finds out about their affair. Jane slowly tells him of a very detailed scenario of Emma going inside the house, catching them doing the act, which results in her thinking about their engagement. At first Paul takes this as a joke, but after Jane gets up and caresses him while she tells him this, his face gets serious. The Jane with short hair, the one seen writing on her notebook, is telling the same lines to Donald. He teases her, saying that she did not really say those lines to Paul. In a flashback scene, Paul suggests that Jane undergo legation to prevent them from having a baby as he knows a doctor. Jane is upset by this and says that maybe her mother was a pregnant maid and she had no choice but to leave her in an orphanage. Paul kids her that perhaps her mother was a queen. Mr. Niven notices that Emma is becoming more impatient. Seeing this and wanting to ease her mood, Mrs. Sheringham tells her that her son, Paul, loves her very much. She then brings up again that he is studying hard. Emma scoffs that he never studies and is always late. She adds that she is not at all cross. Mrs. Sheringham is silent. Emma looks over to her mother who looks down. She excuses herself and goes back to their house. She fixes up her makeup while her eyes are already tearing up. Paul is preparing to go to the picnic with his suit. He instructs Jane what to do before she leaves the house, and says that there is pie for her if she is hungry. He says goodbye to her with a smile and leaves. Jane looks worried as he shuts the door. She watches him drive away through the window. Again, the scene changes to the Jane with short hair. She smokes a cigarette and tells Donald that she's stuck and is going to be late. He tells her that she has been unfaithful as her publisher, Maud, is expecting a thriller novel. She defends that that is what she is writing about. He retorts that it isn't what she is really thinking about. She says that it just swims back every so often. He suggests that they walk, she replies no and says swim. Back to the picnic, Emma smokes at the edge close to the lake while staring at it. Samuel, the waiter Emma was rude to earlier, tells her to not do it. Emma, confused, gets her guard up and disrespectfully questions him. He jokes that he thought she was about to do away with herself and smiles at her. Emma hides her smile. She tells him that she used to swim in the lake when she was young. He replies that so did everyone. She rebuts that no one does anymore. Jane just finished watching Paul leave. He looks at photos of Paul when he was a kid. She also stumbles upon a picture of his late brother. She opens his closet and sniffs his clothes. Short-haired Jane smokes on the bed and watches Donald dress up. He tells her that she is a writer because she has been put in occupational service as early as 14. Jane makes a comment about his room smelling damp. He says that they should be in her room instead. She tells him that Mrs. O'Flynn doesn't like him. He agrees and adds that women like her, don't like men like him. Jane's eyes go down. He tells her that they should get a house that has a writing room for her. She teases him, asking him if he is saying that they should get married. He takes the cigarette from her and fumbles over his words but ends up agreeing. Jane smiles and they share a kiss. She, then, is shown swimming in the lake peacefully before Donald disturbs her. We go back to the Jane who is left in the house of the Sheringhams. She wanders around bare-skinned. She sees a paper regarding Paul and Emma's marriage. Mr. Niven proposes a toast for their assembly. He tells how he and his wife are glad to be there with the other two families. His wife looks disapproving of his toast. He also mentions how the children of those two families feel like their own. His wife tries to stop him by saying his name firmly. Mr. Sheringham jokes about how one of them, referring to Paul, is still not there. Mrs. Niven bursts out, saying that all of them are not there, and breaks down into tears while covering her face. All of them look down, sharing her sorrow. Everyone is silent. Mr. Niven looks to Emma and tells her that they just wish her well and forces a faint smile. He toasts to her and, he adds, to the absent groom. They drink. Mrs. Sheringham's tears fall down. Back at the Sheringham's place, Jane continues to wander around. She walks around the library and pulls out a book. When she pulls it back, we see her dressed in her maid uniform and inside the Niven's library. The book she pulled out has their son's name, James Niven, written on the first page. Jane sits down to read it. Inside she finds a map-looking paper attached to it. Mr. Niven walks in the room, surprised to see Jane in there. She quickly closes the book and stands up. She says that she was just finishing up cleaning the room and will leave immediately. He says that it is alright and leaves the room to Jane. The scene goes back to the Sheringham's library, with Jane, bare-skinned, holding the same book. She reads out loud the first few lines. The Jane with short hair is seen writing those same lines in her notebook at a small bookshop. Donald comes in and goes to the bookshelves. She asks if she can help him. He seems startled when he sees her face. He says he is finding a book for his mother. Jane thinks that his mother is a fan of philosophy as he is looking at books about it. He replies that they are for him. Jane asks if his mother would prefer fiction, to which he replies yes. She continues to ask if his mother reads a lot. He replies of course. She suggests a certain book that she thinks has the most extraordinary adventure. He looks at her and smiles. She smiles faintly and quickly before looking down. This is their first encounter. Jane at the Sheringham's lights a cigarette and smokes in the library. She sits down and takes a pen and James's book with her. She wanders to the kitchen and sees the pie Paul left for her under a cloth. 
She slices the pie and helps herself to it. She also finds a beer to quench her thirst. Once she is done eating, she picks up the knife she used to wash it, but then changes her mind and puts it back on the table. Emma is seen inside a house, dialing someone on the telephone. The phone in the sharing M's rings. The clock also chimes. Jane does not answer the call and goes upstairs. She dresses up and looks at the mirror. She hallucinates Paul's exposed body with his back turned to her. She goes downstairs and cuts a flower from Mrs. Sheringham's orchids. She puts the flower under her shirt. She puts James's book in her bag and opens the doors to leave. The scene transitions with the light from the open doors to a smoke-like screen and finally, to the path in the fields which Jane takes on to go back to the Nivens. We see a slow-motion scene of Jane riding the bike, with the wind in her hair and clothes. Short-haired Jane is seen sitting at a restaurant and putting her cigarette out. She is on a date with Donald. They are eating dinner together. He says that he assumes that she is a writer as she seems like one. She confirms it and goes on to say that he is not a writer. He replies that he is not a writer in the same way as her because, according to him, philosophy is not very interesting. Jane disagrees with his statement, saying that it is very interesting. He asks her when she started writing, she lies by telling him she doesn't know. He doesn't buy her lie and tells her firmly that she does have an answer to his question. She replies that she has been a writer three times over, the day she was born, the day Mr. Paxton gave her a typewriter, the third one she keeps a secret. He says that it is the best answer for his question. He gives her a book by sliding it across the table. Jane looks at him as she tries to hide her smile. Jane arrives at the Niven's place. She sees Mr. Niven in his car outside the house. He looks distressed and is taken back by surprise to see her back so early. He starts to share terrible news about Paul. He was in a car accident. Jane asks him if they are sure that it was him. He apologizes for sharing it with her and gets out of the car. He tells her that he has to go to the Sheringham's house to ensure that nothing there regarding Paul can bring more distress to his family. Jane tries hard to maintain her composure. Both her and Mr. Niven hold back tears. He tells her that someone has to inform the staff at the Sheringham's on the incident. He adds that it would be awful for the Sheringham's to do so, as it pains to repeat the words on their recent loss. He then asks her if she would like to come with him to the Sheringham's place. She stays silent for a moment but then agrees. She apologizes suddenly and asks if she can first get a glass of water before they go. Mr. Niven allows her to. At the kitchen sink, she shatters the glass and cries. She washes her face and tries to calm herself down. She fixes her hair while keeping her emotions in. She goes out, and Mr. Niven drives them off. A somber music plays in the background as a maid fixing Paul's sheets is shown in slow motion. The screen transitions with the white sheets to a smoke-like screen and finally, to the side of the woods. The smoke that we see in this transition and the one before is coming from a burning vehicle. This is Paul's accident. Jane is in anguish the whole ride to the Sheringham's. She and Ethel meet eyes as Ethel cleans Paul's room. Mr. Niven rings the bell. Ethel is surprised to see him and says that no one is home. He tells her the distressing news about Paul. How he had an accident on his way to their lunch at Henley. Jane's eyes go to the orchids inside the house. Mr. Niven continues saying that they were making inquiries because Paul was so late to their lunch, and they were informed by the police that his car was found in a wreckage. Ethel is at a loss for words. She tells Mr. Niven that she thought she had just missed him as the library seems to be recently used, a cigarette recently lit, and his bedroom, a mess. Mr. Niven asks her, almost whispering, if she had found a note or the like in his bedroom. He believes that Paul's incident might be voluntary. She looks to the side and says that she has not found anything written in his bedroom. Mr. Niven and Jane leave. He says to Jane during their ride that that is all five of them, referring to the five boys the two families had already lost, two from the Nivens and three from the Sheringhams. Jane answers yes with a shaking voice. They stop at the house with tears in their eyes. It is autumn. Jane is walking with Donald. She spots an owl that seems to be staring at her. She hears someone trip and turns to see Donald on the ground. At their place, she tries to treat his wound, but he insists that he is fine and it was just a small trip. He jokes to her that she is overreacting. The two giggle and share a kiss. While writing on their bed, Jane notices that Donald seems to be having nightmares while sleeping. She looks at him concerned and caresses his head. Jane removes the coat of Mrs. Niven, who stands still and looks so blankly. She emotionlessly asks Jane if she had been to Upley. Jane lies, saying that she has never been there before today with Mr. Niven. Jane assists her to sit down so she can remove her shoes and jewelry. Mrs. Niven continues from her question and says that it is terribly dark. She tells Jane that when Philip was laid to rest and James had already gone, she felt that they weren't living in guilt anymore, that they don't need to cover nor protect anything anymore as they have nothing more to lose. She asks Jane if that makes sense. Jane agrees. Mrs. Niven continues to tell her that Emma was supposed to marry James. Jane accidentally says yes. Shocked, Mrs. Niven asks her how she had come to know so. Jane becomes silent for a bit and lies that Millie mentioned it to her. Mrs. Niven doubts this, as she thinks that Millie never notices anything. 
She tells Jane that she must have heard it from somewhere else. Mrs. Niven looks cold with teary eyes as Jane removes her necklace. She says to her that she has no mother. Jane agrees and adds that she was left at an orphanage. She is about to go up when Mrs. Niven suddenly takes a hold of her hand. She says that she is very lucky to be already comprehensively bereaved at birth, as she has absolutely nothing to lose ever. Jane looks at her, seemingly upset. Mrs. Niven adds that it is a gift, and she must learn how to use it. She kisses her. Jane's tears start to well up, as well as Mrs. Niven's. Mr. Niven just stares out the window. In the kitchen, Jane hears Millie crying and can't help but cry as well. Jane undresses and removes the protection inside her. Traces of bodily fluid can be seen. She also removes the orchid she cut earlier. She breaks down again while holding the flower. In the mirror, she says to her reflection that she has nothing to lose and everything to gain. She writes once upon a time twice in her notebook. Her voice is saying these same words as she writes them. Paul is with Jane during winter. They sit next to each other as he tells her a memory with his late brothers. He refers to her as Jay as he starts the story. Their mother woke them all up very early and bundled them into a car with blankets. He now calls Jane by her name. His family packed a picnic and they stopped there, at the same place Paul and Jane were standing in. It wasn't covered in snow in Paul's story. He says that there was green grass everywhere that was perfectly clipped. He looks at Jane's lips as he asks her to imagine it for him and for herself. A grass field is shown. He emphasizes imagining it for herself. The same grass field, this time covered in snow, is shown with both of them sitting next to each other. At the bookshop, Mr. Paxton gives Jane his old typewriter as he is getting a new one. She just looks at it and smiles. She thanks him. Donald and Jane sit on a hospital bed. He has a tumor in his brain. He jokes about it, saying it is poetic, but is clearly in a dismal mood about it. She asks him when will the doctors start the operation to get it out. He looks at her with sorrow and slightly tilts his head to the side, and inhales and exhales deeply. His tumor is inoperable. Jane does not accept this fact as he just went to the doctor because of the cut he got from his trip. He asks her if she wants them to just ignore it. She answers yes with her voice breaking. He says that maybe they can try to, for a little while, at least. They sit on a bench. The scenery is full of trees and plants. It is windy and they have blankets on. Donald tells Jane that she will write a book about the whole feeling of life. She says she has lost all sense of it with an unlit cigarette on her lips. Donald insists and says that it will be her greatest book. She asks him if he thinks she has not written her greatest book yet. She lights up her cigarette and puts her head on his shoulder. She kids that maybe all the men she loves need to pass away in order for her to write her great book. They both laugh. Jane says that maybe she won't be able to write it. Donald says she will and it will be brilliant. They both look forward and stay silent. Back at the Nivens, Jane comes to the dining table to serve Mr. Niven his breakfast. They greet each other a good morning and he comes to the window to let her serve his meal. Jane walks slowly to him. He is perplexed and asks her what the matter is. She says that she thinks it might be time for her to leave her job, and that she found a new position. He asks if it is in another house. She shakes her head and tells him that it is a position in a bookshop. He thinks about it for a while and approves of it. An up-tempo piano plays as she leaves the room. Donald and Jane are both lying in the hospital bed. Donald asks Jane to tell him her secret with a weak voice. He asks her what was the third thing that made her write. She starts to cry. He adds that he wishes that they had told each other everything. She says that there wouldn't have been enough time. He asks her to whisper her secret to him and says that he will take it to his grave. She smiles while sniffling. She whispers that she loves him. He closes his eyes and opens them. He takes his last breath. Jane slowly walks out of the hospital tearfully. She rides her bike away from it with her mouth open. The screen transitions to when she was riding her bike from the Sheringhams, the day Paul had an accident. His burning car is also shown with the view from above. We see scenes of Jane typing quickly on a typewriter and her wandering in the Sheringhams library. Jane is now old, as we saw briefly earlier in the movie. She scoffs as she hears her telephone ringing and someone on the door knocking. She doesn't answer the phone and opens the door to a group of reporters, asking for her comment on her winning a prestigious award. Donald was right about her writing being a success. She tells the group flatly that she has won all of the prizes and that she stores them somewhere in the attic. A reporter asks her if she is not pleased. She says that she feels delighted and thanks them. She snickers and asks them if she has disappointed them with her answer. The reporters all lightly shake their heads. She continues, with a little more enthusiasm, that although the task was impossible, it was wonderful. She chuckles and hallucinates her younger self in the group, smiling. She chuckles once more and closes the door to go back to her writing area inside. She looks out the window and her voiceover can be heard. She says that the fourth leg was her, referring to Paul's story of a racehorse wherein he and his brothers own a leg each. The younger Jane, the one that was wandering in the Sheringham's library before, tells the camera, almost whispering, that all five of them were standing behind at the rail and watching Fandango race. A soft music plays in the background as we see a slow motion of Fandango running. Behind the rail, we see Jane standing alone looking to the side. The movie ends as she slowly turns her head to the camera and stares at it before showing a small smile. 